Good evening, everybody, and welcome to this talk in the Greenwich Society series of talks, which we've organised over the winter. It's one of the few ways in which we can um, provide some activities for members, which are actually allowed by the COVID restrictions. Um, many of you, I know, are members of the Greenwich Society, but um, for those of, you, those of you who are not, um, can I recommend membership? Um, the objectives of the Greenwich Society are to conserve and protect and maintain the historic and built environment of Greenwich and its green spaces. There's a great deal of work to do in achieving this objective. Um, because on the one hand, we have a particularly precious stock of historic buildings, World Heritage Site, Greenwich Park, and so on. And on the other hand, we are currently subject to very considerable development pressures. And the weighing up of these things and the conserving of our historic buildings and the green spaces is a constant challenge. So we'd very much welcome more members for the Greenwich Society, both for the moral support you can give us, but also for the financial help, uh, which the modest membership uh, fee brings to us. You can find out more about our work, about member benefits and how to join by going to the Greenwich Society website. And you can find that by going to your browser inputting um, Greenwich Society. Thank you, Richard. My talk should last around 30 minutes and I'll be very happy at the end of it to take any questions that the audience might have. Um, my talks is, is augmented by um, some um, slides and, and other visuals. And I'd very much like to thank my wife, Carol, who's um, very competently um, managing those for me. Thank you. A fine retreat. Captain James Cook's links with Greenwich and East London. I first gave this talk to a dinner of the Cook Society held in the Octagon Room in Flamsteed House at the Royal Observatory some years ago. I started my remarks that evening with the perhaps provocative comment that James Cook possibly, indeed probably, once stood in that very room as it was used by the Astronomer Royal to receive important guests. Regretfully, due to, due to COVID-19 lockdowns that we're under, undergoing at the moment, tonight I speak to you from our home in Greenwich. One thing's for certain, James Cook has never visited our house. Cook was not from London. He was born in Martin in North Yorkshire in 1728, and he grew up on a farm until age 17. He was apprenticed to a shopkeeper in Staves, a Yorkshire fishing village. And the image here on the left is a, a, a photograph I took last year when we had the good fortune to visit Staves. Two years later, he chose to leave this for an apprenticeship with a Whitby ship owner whose vessels brought coal down to London, generally unloading around Wapping. And the image on the right is of, um, is of Whitby Harbour, the famous Whitby Harbour today. In 1755, age 26, Cook volunteered to join the Royal Navy. 26 was considered to be quite an old age to um, sign up with the Navy back then. He didn't join as an officer and he never really acquired the polish of most Royal Naval officers. Similarly, he never lost the burr of his North Yorkshire accent. Notwithstanding, two years later, he successfully took the exam at Trinity House in Deptford little more than a mile or so from where I sit tonight. He, he sat this exam to get his master's certificate, which would enable him to command a Royal Navy vessel. From that point forward, Greenwich and East London figured prominently in Cook's life, professionally and, and domestically. And tonight I wish to explore these links using wherever possible, objects and images from the National Maritime Museum's preeminent collection of Cook related materials parts of which are on display in the exhibition Pacific Encounters, which opened in late 2018. 
Indeed, as I'll explain later, had things played out differently, Cook would have lived out his well-deserved retirement here in Greenwich with his devoted wife, Elizabeth. In the late 1760s and 1770s, James Cook captained three epic voyages from Britain to the Pacific, that immense ocean covering a third of our, uh, of, of our planet's surface. His first two voyages earned him celebrity status, but both voyages had been long and arduous. And on arriving home after the second voyage in July 1775, Cook was exhausted, physically and mentally. The National Maritime Museum owns this gritty portrait of Cook painted just after the end of the second voyage or perhaps soon, shortly there before. And it was painted by the expedition's official artist, William Hodges. The strain of three years of command is etched into Cook's craggy, weather-beaten features. As reward for his phenomenal deeds, Cook was promoted to post-captain, a post which generally led to one eventually becoming an admiral. And he was made one of four captains overseeing the, the Royal Seamen's Hospital at Greenwich. Established in 1694, Greenwich Hospital was by the 1770s home to some 2,350 naval pensioners. Its captaincy posts were essentially sinecures, making few demands on the holder, yet offering a handsome salary of 230 pounds, plus an entertaining allowance, free fire and light, and free quarters for him and his family, although Cook actually preferred to commute daily from home. The salary put him in the top 5% of British wage earners. Cook took up the post at Greenwich in August, 1775, but in a letter to his old Whitby master written later that year, he confided, a few months ago, the whole Southern Hemisphere was hardly big enough for me. And now I'm, in, I'm, and now I'm going to be confined within the limits of Greenwich Hospital, which are far too small for an active mind like mine. I must confess, however, it is a fine retreat and a pretty income. But whether I can bring myself to ease into retirement, time will show. Greenwich and East London were very familiar to Cook long before the Greenwich Hospital post arose. In December 1762, aged 34, after a whirlwind courtship of just a few weeks, he had married Elizabeth Batts, 13 years his junior, at St Margaret's Church in Barking, East London. Depending which books one reads, Elizabeth's father was either a Shadwell merchant or the publican of the Bell Inn opposite execution dock in Wapping. With Cook's savings and modest pay, the, newly, the newlyweds bought a 61 year lease, paying some 16 pounds a year, on a new three story terrace house comprising around eight rooms at seven Assembly, Play, Assembly Road, which has now been renumbered as 88 Mile End Road in Stepney. Behind the house was a, was a gin distillery and wine vaults with a bakery, the adjoining neighbour to the east. So the air must have been somewhat pungent. It was an up and coming neighbourhood, still fringed by fields and orchards. Its proximity to the river made it a strong maritime community, peppered with, e peppered with East India Company captains, Navy officers, Navy office staff, mariners and maritime traders. Indeed, a near neighbour was one of the naval captains who examined Cook for his lieutenant's certificate in, in 1768. Cook's house was unceremoniously demolished in 1959, even though a London City Council plaque honouring Cook had been affixed to it in 1907. As you can see in this slide, a large slate plaque acknowledging its illustrious former owner was reinstated in 1970 to mark the bicentenary of Cook's Endeavour voyage. One Australian writer who visited the site around 2000 quipped after surveying the modern streetscape of ethnic restaurants and a very culturally diverse residency. He wrote, Cook didn't really need to sail around the globe. If he'd stayed here long enough, the world would have come to him. The Cook's home life seems to have been happy, but marred by tragedy. 
Like most maritime families, the couple were apart much more than they were together. Nevertheless, they had six children. Elizabeth invariably becoming pregnant soon after Cook's returns. Tragically, three of their children died very young while their father was away at sea. And Elizabeth's cousin, Frances Wardale, lived in for the first decade, both to help Elizabeth and to provide companionship. When Cook returned from his second great voyage, he and Elizabeth had spent less than four years together in their 13 year marriage. It's true to say his surviving children hardly knew him. Within weeks of moving into their new house, Cook set sail for North America. Between 1763 and 66, he spent each summer charting Newfoundland, which had been recently acquired by Britain at the end of the Seven Years' War. He passed the winters with his family in Mile End, drawing up the charts from his previous summer's work and planning his next voyage. His surveying talents had been first identified by General Wolfe, Cook preparing the way for Wolfe's assault on the Plains of Abraham. One wonders if, years later, Cook ever visited St Elphage Church here in Greenwich, where Cook lies buried in, a, in the family vault, or indeed if he knew that Wolfe's house adjoins Greenwich Park to this day, as you can see in these images here. Cook gained an enviable reputation for the excellence of his charting work, which led him to be appointed to command an expedition to the Pacific, sponsored by the Royal Society, to observe the transit of Venus on the 3rd of June, 1769, and then do other things as well. His ship, a four-year-old former Whitby Collier renamed HM Bark Endeavour, was refitted for the mission in the single dock at Deptford Royal Dockyard. The scale and form of the dockyard is wonderfully conveyed in this model, which, had been, which was made in the early 1770s. Contrary to popular belief, Cook played no role in selecting the ship. It had in fact been purchased before he was appointed. Cook regularly traveled down from Mile End to inspect the fit out work, either by taking a boat downstream or merely across the river, after which he could then enjoy a brisk walk onto Deptford. The fit out work was complicated by the needs to insert cabins in, uh, in and other spaces for the young 25, for the young naturalist, Joseph Banks and his 10 man entourage of, entourage of scientists, artists and servants. This image in front of you now, are the line drawings, would you believe, for the Endeavour refit, uh, one of the treasures of the National Maritime Museum. And if we go on to the next slide, here you've got the um, internal fit out drawings um, uh, for the voyage also in, uh, in the collection of uh, at Greenwich. And I must say both sets of drawings were um, crucial to the building of the Endeavour replica in the, um, in the late 1980s and 1990s. Greenwich featured prominently in Cook's preparations in three ways. Firstly, to observe the transit of Venus required very accurate scientific instruments, most of which the Royal Society provided to the expedition. These also included, in the words of the Royal Society's minute book, quote, an astronomical clock and alarm clock now at the Royal Observatory. Cook, Cook and the Royal Astronomer, Neville Maskelin, jointly oversaw the construction of a portable, observa uh, a portable observatory made of wood and canvas from which the transit would be observed in Tahiti. And here, as you can see in this image, a replica of this tent was made at the museum and is now displayed in the Pacific Encounters expedition, uh, exhibition. And thirdly, Endeavour was to be the first, uh, was to have the first extended voyage to carry a set of Maskelin's newly created nautical almanac, a set of complex astronomical tables for every day of the year with which a ship at sea could calculate its longitude. These, this almanac being new, it's likely that Maskelin, I think, would have wanted to, uh, to school Cook in its usage. So adding all these points together, plus the proximity of Greenwich to Deptford, and this is a lovely image showing from Deptford Royal Dockyard, um, looking, looking across, looking down river 
to um, the twin towers of the of the uh, of the um, hospital. Adding all these points together, it makes me feel confident that Cook certainly visited the Royal Observatory while Endeavour was being made ready. The ship's refit took some six weeks, longer than planned, as for several weeks in May, the dockyard was hit by, quote, tumults and riots on the river. According to one account, a great body of sailors assembled at Deptford Yard. They forcibly went aboard several ships, unfurling their topsails, and vowed no ship should sail out of the Thames till the merchants had consented to raise their wages. Endeavour was dry docked alone. Thus, it seemed likely that it would have been one of the ships boarded. Regretfully, this delay exposed the newly sheathed and corked hull to an unwelcome stint of drying out in what proved a particularly hot um, period of weather. Cook then took his, his, his ship for trial sails up and down the river to assess its ballasting needs and to better understand its handling. Finally, on the 30th of July, Endeavour made its way under pilot downriver to Galleon's Reach between Woolwich and Thamesmead, near today's Woolwich Arsenal, where it took on guns, powder and shot. And this image shows you um, Galleon's Reach. It's on the extreme left-hand side um, in the distance. Now, the view from the decks of the bark as it sailed past Greenwich heading down to, to Galleon's Reach must have been much as that painted by Canaletto some 15 years earlier. And were Cook to be alive today, he'd still recognise the scene, as remarkably, the vista looking south to the Royal Observatory, the Royal Park, the Queen's House and Greenwich Hospital, that this vista is little changed to this very day. Here's another view of it, this time um, taken from um, the foot of the Isle of, of, Isle of Dogs, again, uh, looking across to the hospital. After Galleon's Reach, the ship left the Thames for Plymouth, where four more carriage guns were loaded aboard. On the 26th of August, Joseph Banks and his retinue boarded and Endeavour headed out to sea. One of Endeavour's four pounder carriage guns today sits in the Pacific Encounters Gallery in Greenwich. It and five others were jettisoned on the 10th of June, 1770, when the ship hit the Great Barrier Reef and Cook ordered that all cannon on the upper deck and much ballast be cast overboard to lighten the ship and thus hopefully allow it to float off the reef. The cannon were rediscovered and raised from the seabed by an American university research team in 1969 and one was presented to the National Maritime Museum at Greenwich. Others today can be seen at the Australian National Maritime Museum in Sydney and at New Zealand's National Museum in Wellington. It would be nearly three years before Cook saw England again. Tragically, more than a third of Endeavour's original 94 inhabitants never made it home. Most of them succumbed to malaria or dysentery contracted when the ship visited Batavia, modern day Jakarta. On first stepping ashore at Deal on the 13th of July, 1771, Cook shared a seven hour carriage ride up to London with Banks and immediately went to the Admiralty office to report back before proceeding on to Mile End. As well as successfully viewing the transit, Cook had circumnavigated both islands of New Zealand and in European terms, discovered the East Coast of Australia, which he claimed for his king. The 1,074 day voyage was considerably longer than had been anticipated. The time linked tables in Masculine's Nautical Almanac had run out by this time, thus requiring Cook to undertake even more complex computations to calculate his longitude for the latter part of the mission. Unsurprisingly, the Endeavour voyage made Cook a national celebrity. That August, he was promoted to captain. Another Endeavour veteran to, to achieve celebrity status of sorts was the ship's goat. This intrepid traveller had sailed around the world twice, first aboard Samuel Wallace's Royal Naval Ship Dolphin, then with Cook, providing milk to the officers. 
Samuel Johnson, the great literary figure of the day, was inspired to compose a couplet in its honour. Quote, the globe twice circled, this the goat, the second to the nurse of Jove, is thus rewarded for her never failing milk. The goat was farmed out to Mile End. Indeed, some people claim it was, it was um, actually in Cook's back garden. And this was done in expectation of it joining fellow retired voyagers at Greenwich Hospital. But sadly, this proved all too much for the goat and uh, it, it, um, it, um, uh, it died in 1772 before its retirement plan had fully materialized. The ship itself got no such glory. Um, Endeavour went to the Woolwich Royal Dockyard for refitting as a supply ship for the voyage to the Falklands. And here is another one of the great models, this one of Woolwich Dockyard around 1772. So um, very much the time at, at which uh, the former Endeavour was there. Within a year, Cook was again setting sail on a second epic, ex epic voyage of circumnavigation. This time charged to prove or disprove the existence of the much vaunted Great Southern Land. It had been judged that what Cook's first voyage had found wasn't large enough to be the fabled terra incognita. He was given for his second voyage another two sturdy Whitby built ships. Resolution, some 460 tonnes, which was refitted at Deptford, and the smaller Adventure, refitted at Woolwich, alongside the, the battered Endeavour. And it's quite possible that their fit outs were overseen by one of Cook's immediate neighbours from Assembly Row, John Binmer, who was the assistant to the surveyor of the Navy. As with his first great Pacific voyage, Cook's second expedition also had close Greenwich links. Resolution was the first Royal Naval ship on an extended voyage to carry a sea clock or what we call a chronometer, K1, a copy of John Harrison's revolutionary timepiece, H4. This allowed Cook to find his longitude by comparing the local time calculated from a sextant reading taken of the noonday sun against the time at the Greenwich Meridian, i.e. at the Royal Observatory. And this time was kept as shown by a very accurate timekeeper, K1, carried aboard his ship. The new technology performed magnificently right throughout the 1100 plus day voyage, some three years, 17 days. In his journal, Cook described K1 as my trusty friend, the watch and never failing guide. Just, just as after the first voyage, immediately he stepped ashore at Plymouth in July, 1775, Cook took a coach to London, again to report in at the Admiralty. Then he headed home. He had been at sea for six of the previous seven years. Within weeks, Elizabeth was again pregnant. As described earlier, Greenwich took on an even greater significance for Cook when on returning from the second voyage, the much fated explorer was appointed a resident captain at Greenwich Hospital. But as I described earlier, Cook wasn't, was uncertain if he was ready for the easy life of retirement. In short, he was not. Although tired and his health failing, a mere six months after returning from voyage number two, Cook again put himself forward to lead another voyage of discovery, this time to the North Pacific in search of the fabled Northwest Passage. Unlike either of his earlier voyages, this time a 20,000 pound prize was on offer if the, if the passage could be found. 20,000 pounds being the 20,000 pounds being the equal of, of 4.5 million pounds today. This was a temptation too great to resist. Cannily, when offering himself to lead the new expedition, Cook requested that on his return, the Admiralty Lords might, in Cook's words, either restore me to my appointment in the hospital or procure for me such other mark of the royal favour as their lordships upon review of my past services shall think me deserving. Once the appointment was confirmed, he again confided to his old Whitby master, John Walker, and I quote him, it is certain I have quitted an easy retirement for an active and perhaps dangerous voyage. My present disposition is more favorable to the latter 
than the former. If I am fortunate enough to get safe home, there is no doubt, but it will be greatly to my advantage. He stepped down from the hospital in April 76 to prepare for the new voyage. He would again command resolution with the much smaller ex collier renamed Discovery, his support ship. The vessels were sent to Deptford, but their refitting dragged and it later proved the work had been shoddy and poorly supervised. Unlike his meticulous preparations for the two earlier voyages, Cook seemed somewhat distracted this time. The host of one of the many lavish farewell dinners that was staged in his honour observed, quote, it was curious to see Cook, a grave, steady man, and his wife, a decent, plump Englishwoman, and think that he was preparing to sail around the world. I might add that um, Elizabeth was plump because she was again pregnant. So delayed was the departure, there was no time for the ships to undertake the customary sea trials. They eventually set sail in July, but within days, both ships were leaking worryingly. After enduring a heavy storm early in the voyage, one of Resolution's officers railed in his diary, the wind pouring into the officer's cabins through the ship's sides to the destruction of everything therein, a barbarous neglect of the officers in Deptford Yard. On a more positive note, Cook was this time carrying not only C clock K1, but also K3, although the latter proved less reliable. And, on, and both of these clocks can be seen in Pacific encounters. They're both wonderful. Before embarking on the third voyage, Cook sat briefly for this formal portrait painted by Nathaniel Dance, a popular portrait artist of the day. Joseph Banks had commissioned the work to hang in his library alongside the paintings of a kangaroo and a dingo that he'd, done, that he'd had done shortly after returning from the Endeavour voyage. The Dance portrait was later given to Greenwich Hospital by Banks' executor, where for a time at least, it was displayed near Turner's famous Battle of Trafalgar. And in the image here on the right, you can see um, the pensioners showing some guests, one assumes um, um, Turner's famous painting. But if you look behind them on the pillar, you can see a sketch of, of the dance portrait of Cook, that, that, that's where it hung. The dance portrait has been on show at the National Maritime Museum since the museum's opening in 1937. As we all know, Cook would never see England again. On the 14th of February, 1779, he was killed in a skirmish with locals on the island of Hawaii. Cook had been well received when he first visited the island earlier in the voyage. He now returned only because a heavy storm had split resolutions foremost and reopened serious leaks in the hull. One Cook biographer, Richard Howe, blames the shoddy refitting of the ship at Deptford. He calls it the Deptford disease. He blames this for Cook's tragic death. Deptford, Howe asserts, was, quote, Cook's real killer. Had Cook not, not accepted the command for the third voyage, it's likely that he and Mrs. Cook would have lived out a long and peaceful retirement residing in quarters at Greenwich Hospital, admiring the panoramic views from the Thames to the Queen's House and beyond to the <coughs> country. Instead, she lived, near, she lived the next six decades a widow, receiving a comfortable pension of 200 pounds from the Admiralty, plus the royalty or some royalties from her husband's very successful publications and the inheritance inheritances left by their adult children. Before she died, aged 93, she had destroyed all the letters James had written her. Perhaps curiously, in July 1778, after Cook had left on the third voyage, Elizabeth had moved the few miles from Mile End to Clapham to live in the house of her nephew, Isaac Smith, who had sailed in Cook's first two voyages. One assumes that her husband had been, had been involved in the decision to leave Assembly Row. Perhaps Captain and Mrs Cook were unburdening themselves in readiness of moving into Greenwich Hospital quarters after James's return. One of the most curious Cook-related items 
in the museum's collections is Johann Zoffany's painting, The Death of Captain Cook, painted nearly 20 years after Cook's demise. Zoffany never completed the painting, but it was nevertheless sold to Mrs. Cook in 1827. You can see the, the painting here on the left. Given its gory subject matter, it's hard to understand why she, why she would have wanted it on her wall. Perhaps she simply wished to have it removed from public view. After her death, the canvas was presented to Greenwich Hospital in 1835 by her executor to hang in the National Gallery of Marine Paintings, what we know today as the Painted Hall. And here's a, an image on the right showing it in its, in, in its format when it, was a, when it was an art gallery. The Zoffany painting was transferred to the, to the National Maritime Museum in 1936, and it too now hangs in Pacific Encounters. Around the same time, Frank Cowell, the last survivor of those ashore with Cook when he was fatally attacked, was included in this boisterous painting of Greenwich pensioners celebrating Trafalgar Day in Greenwich Park. And Cowell is on the left-hand side of the painting. Um, he's, the, he's the man carving, carving the, um, the meat on the table. The interconnectivity of naval matters is well illustrated by the career of John Gore, an American-born officer who Cook brought into his Endeavour crew as second lieutenant, largely because Gore had already visited Tahiti aboard Wallace's Dolphin. A keen hunter, it was Gore who shot the small kangaroo whose pelt Joseph Banks took back to England and then commissioned George Stubbs to create the first European painting of this singular animal, now viewable in Pacific Encounters. Gore rejoined Cook for the third voyage, this time as second in command on resolution. When Cook was killed, Gore became captain of the smaller vessel HMS Discovery. And eventually he became the, the expedition's overall commander when his colleague who, who was captaining resolution also died. Once the two ships successfully got back to England, Gore had circumnavigated the world, would you believe, four times. His reward was the, was the resident captain's role that Cook had vacated at Greenwich Hospital. And this is where Gore died in 1790. In a small way, I too have a personal tale of Cook-related linkages. In 1970, Britain marked the bicentenary of Cook's charting of Eastern Australia by commissioning a large model of endeavour which the Queen presented to the Australian nation. The model was made in the National Maritime Museum's workshops in Greenwich. For many years, the model was displayed in the foyer of the National Library of Australia in Canberra, where I admired it countless times while using the library as a student in the 1970s. In 1991, the model was moved to the newly created Australian National Maritime Museum in Sydney, of which I was the inaugural director. And, and little did I realise back in the early 70s that I'd one day become its custodian, or indeed later I'd lead the museum in which this fine model had been crafted. James Cook's many and diverse links with Greenwich and environs are interesting and revealing in and of themselves. But I'd like to contend that taken together, these links also provide a fine lens through which one can view many facets of British naval and maritime life in the 18th century. Shipbuilding and repair, provisioning and ordnance, science and technology, manpower training and discipline, family and social life and community welfare. This year, 2021, marks the 250th anniversary of Cook's arrival back from his Endeavour voyage. Hopefully tonight, I've been able to convince you that his local links also warrant some exploration. Thank you. Kevin, thank you very much indeed. That was fascinating. And you'll probably be glad to hear that um, while you were speaking, more people came in and we had over a hundred by the end. So one can't always guarantee there'd be as many people at the end as there are at the beginning. In your case, it was rather more. Um, would people like to ask questions? 
use the chat facility because I can't possibly see you if you wave your hand. There are a hundred little pictures. So um, use the chat facility. Yes. Um, question from Ian Borum. Ian, would you like to unmute and put your question? No, well, I'll... thank you. you. There. Yes. Yeah, I'll well, yeah. Uh, yes, so um, you mentioned that Cook became a governor at Greenwich Hospital uh, and he mentioned it in a letter saying um, it was a bit small there. But apart from that letter, is there actually any evidence that he ever went there? Oh, yes. Or he went yes. there very frequently? Yes, indeed. Now, he took up the post. So he was in the post from August, uh, August 76 to April 77. Um, and so, no, he was going, he was going on a daily basis. Um, he, he could have moved in with his wife, but um, at that stage, they still preferred to live in Mile End. So, so what's um, the uh, evidence? Sorry? What's the evidence, please? I've never seen any, come across any. What is the um, evidence that he actually kept going to the Greenwich? Just because he was appointed doesn't mean to say he ever went there. Um, oh, I, 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 I believe he did go there, um, but um, I haven't got the, the notes in front of me here on it. But uh, he, 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 it's not as if it was an appointment that he never, he never took up. You know, as I say, he was in the, he held the post for some, um, whatever it was, eight or nine months. Thank you. There's a question from Jeffrey. It's Mount Evans. Jeffrey Mount Evans. Thank you. Um, Kevin, um, what a pleasure to see you and Carol, and what a fantastic talk. Thank you so very much. The thought crosses my mind, you're so eminently qualified as an Australian and really a distinguished honorary Brit now. Have you thought yourself ever of writing a biography of um, Cook yourself? No. Give a short answer <laughs> to that. No. There, are, there, are, there are people far better qualified than me to, uh, to, to, to do that, and uh, I must say, I do have I have numerous, it was interesting to see how many cookbooks I've got um, in my study, not in the kitchen. Um, and, uh, but no, it, it's, uh, it, this is a subject which I've always thought really interesting to see his, the, the local side of Cook um, mm -hmm. and the linkages with the Royal Dockyards, etc. cetera. But, um, but no, he, it, he's, I don't think I've got a Cook biography in me. <laughs> <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, I think this is a question from Richard Cole McIntosh, is it? Yeah. Would you like to unmute? No, I was just saying thank you very much, Kevin. That was fascinating. Right, okay. Right. Um, a question from someone called- Can I just ask Richard, I just posed a question and I'm pinging up the Southeast Chamber of Commerce, apologies. Yeah. It's from Helen, and my question is, can we officially say that Australia started from Deptford? <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, really? No, because Australia is a continent, and Australia has an east and a west, <laughs> and the Dutch were there some 150 years before Cook. Um, and of course, Australia also has indigenous people who were there for some 60,000 years. Mm -hmm. Before, before the Dutch and before Cook. So Australia, is, Australia um, uh, was inhabited um, um, you know, um, a long, long time before Cook arrived on the scene yep. and Cook arrived on the East Coast, but the Dutch, the Dutch so, so there was the, the West Coast of Australia appeared on charts before Cook undertook his exped, exped, expedition. Ah, I was only sort of trying to get a bit of localism here that, that, that how we got to, we knew it was sort of there, but did, we didn't know it was there. And for many years, I've been quoting Dr. Roger Knight saying yeah. sort of Australia, as we know it today, started in Deptford. <laughs> yeah, well, um, I've never, he's, okay. Roger's never said that to me. He's never had the courage <laughs> to, to say that to me, I might add. In terms of cooked exp expedition, the role of Deptford in terms of um, making of, of fitting out Endeavour is yeah. is is exactly. really fascinating. Yeah, 
absolutely. And from... I think actually that's basically the point because it was yeah, Endeavour sure. from our, obviously Australia was there. We didn't quite know it, but Endeavour sailed off and then we, um, we technically found it. Well, I, in a European... No, no, no. <laughs> I've got a question now from... <laughs> Thank you. Lizanne Wilson. Lizanne, are you there? Lizanne? Yes, I'm here. I'm just asking, um, how would you rate Cook as a cartographer? Um, I, there are some in the audience who can rate him better than me. I think Cook was, was um, basically unsurpassed. Um, and there are, there are some of Cook's charts were still being used um, well into the 20th century. Um, and uh, uh, you know his his skill his uh, was um, was unrivaled. Can I chip in? <clears throat> Sorry to interrupt. Yeah, yes. But in Hi. the great thing, the great thing about Cook's charts was that he didn't just show what he found; he showed what he didn't know. He mm. used dotted lines for the bits he wasn't sure about, mm. unlike other cartographers who would lead you to believe that they knew everything. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. Um, question from Sally McKenzie. Sally McKenzie. I actually, it's Angus uh, McKenzie, but um, I'm just wondering, uh, Kevin, whether you'd sailed on the Endeavour replica, which... Huh. Um, that's very funny you should ask that, because the, the short answer is no. Um, I was, uh, the ship was being built in Western Australia when I was director of the Australian National Maritime Museum. But it didn't actually arrive in Sydney um, until after I'd left the Maritime Museum and had moved to the Powerhouse Museum. Now, my successor did invite me to um, go uh, aboard the ship uh, when it was coming into Sydney Harbour for its first visit. And the plan was the ship would come into Botany Bay, which, of course, is where Cook went. And then it would, it would overnight there. And then I think the next day come into, um, come into Sydney Harbour with great you know, fanfare. The afternoon, the previous afternoon went on and on and we weren't getting the call, Carol and I, to go down to, um, to Botany Bay to go on board. And it was all sort of a bit weird what was going on. We eventually discovered, and this is hilarious, um, the captain in whatever year it was, 2002 or whatever, went, um, um, uh, went and hit a sandbar. <laughs> And so, and, so, and so going into the same piece of water that Cook went into without problem, um, with modern charts and all the rest, Endeavour went, um, went up on a sandbar. And so the whole, uh, the whole schedule got, had to be shifted. And, um, and so us getting on board um, never happened. So, um, so no, sadly, I, I've, I, while I've been on board the ship many times, it's always been when it's tied up at a wharf. Well, Kevin, that would have been good training for the hitch at the beginning on Zoom. <laughs> um, Archie Smith, I think, has a question. Archie? Yes, thank you very much, Richard. Just a quick question to Kevin. How good to see you. And thank you, mm -hmm. Kevin. Fascinating talk. Uh, tell us a little bit more, if you can, about uh, Captain Cook's sad demise in Hawaii. And uh, obviously, that was the end of his, uh, his potential retirement. Yeah, well, as I, as I said um, in the talk, that um, you know he was certainly not you know not expected to go back there, and there's all the stories that people have heard about about religious connotations and local ceremonies, etc., that were happening that happened on Hawaii, and which, when his first arrival, seemed to be um, uh, seemed to um, be um, uh, a, 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 a sign of of of, um, of great symbolism, um, but when going back was was not did not carry the same um, positive connotations with the um, with the Hawaiians. And uh, there had been um, something had been stolen and Cook had gone back to try and get things recovered, etc. And went ashore um, and um, things, you know, um, got out of hand and uh, and he was he was attacked. Um, he had only had a small group of Marines with him and um, they had to um, they had to, you know, they couldn't save him, and they had to make their way back to the ship. Um, and uh, the next day, I think it was, or the day after, um, some dismembered parts of of Cook's body were returned to the ship, um, uh, which 
I didn't put it in the in the in the paper, but it's um I, I thought it's rather curious that that um Cal the um last descendant is depicted in that painting as carving up the meat, um which seems a somewhat unfortunate connotation given the given Cook's sad demise. Um, so it was it was all a very a terrible misunderstanding, um, but um, but you know nevertheless you know that that's what it was. Um, in a way, I was just thinking about this today. The the other remarkable, well, there are many remarkable things, but of course, you know, I spoke about the cannon and them being um, having been jettisoned on the reef. Cook getting off the Great Barrier Reef was just remarkable, and then being able to um, go up the Inde what became the Endeavour River to careen the ship and repair the ship, make running repairs that were good enough for the ship to then get round to Batavia was an extraordinary piece of, of, um, of seamanship and captaincy and work by his crew. And of course, had they not succeeded um, and the ship was lost, and the sh if the ship had been lost on the barrier reef, I'm not sure the cook, cook would qualify as nothing more than a small footnote in British maritime history. That's mm. easy. Thank you very much. Question from Mark Stanner. Stanner. Kevin, really good to see you again, and thanks for a great talk. Um, we, we talk in the, in the Navy about captains being lucky. Yeah. Um, Cook was a deep professional and had his spate of un, unlucky in, 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 in instance. Can, can you give some evidence of where he just might have struck lucky in some of the things he did? Well. And, and, well, and, 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 and achieved? Yeah, well, the obvious one is, is the one I think I just mentioned, the one about, you know, going up on the Barrier Reef, um, which, uh, you know, and, and as you know better than any of us, um, um, in, uh, must be one of the most difficult pieces of water anywhere in the world, given the nature of the reef. Um, and uh, for him to get the ship off um, and nurse the ship ashore, then make the repairs, et cetera, et cetera, was, has to have been an incredibly lucky piece of, lucky in one sense, but as I say, amazing, amazing um, seamanship and crew management, etc. Um, it's often said of Cook um, uh, that uh, you know there are there are similarities between what Cook did and, and modern day space programs, and in that sense, if you're going somewhere where you know, your chances, if something goes wrong, of getting back are pretty limited, and uh, and so in a sense, the Endeavour voyage had a, had a had a bit of an Apollo. Well, it was better than Apollo 13 because they did what they were meant to do as well as as well as recovering, whereas you know the Apollo astronauts didn't didn't, didn't fulfil their original mission. Um, um, other things, I think he, he he obviously had very good crew and he commanded great respect from his from his men. Um, uh, he the, the the thing that puzzles me with him and is is the third voyage and it's going back to being unlucky in a sense or making your own luck. You know, as I said in the paper. It seems strange that he he somehow took his eye off the ball and didn't seem to put in the same level of personal scrutiny and supervision and oversight for the third voyage as he did for the first two, and um, you know it it, it counted it pay, he paid a heavy price for that. Thank you, um, Peter French. Thank you. Kevin, uh, thank you. Just like everybody else, I found that uh, that talk fascinating. Uh, I just wondered, though, whether you've been forgiven yet by the Australians for purchasing the uh, the two Stubbs paintings, the kangaroo and the dingo. Um, well, I don't, it's a year now since I've been out there, given coronavirus. So, um, so you know, um, whether what whether whether it, whether that's changing, I don't know. Um, what Peter's alluding to is when. When the museum in Greenwich decided to acquire, to try and acquire the kangaroo and dingo paintings after they'd had an export stop on them, after they'd been sold uh, out, of, out of the country at that stage to a buyer that nobody knew or a potential buyer that nobody knew. When we decided at Greenwich we would buy them and, um, uh, uh, and word of that got out in Australia, um, it, it did attract some criticism in Australia and in particular there was a, um, a guy who, uh, an ex-comedian who ran, who was the presenter on the main breakfast radio show in, in Melbourne on the ABC, the Australian equivalent of the BBC. And this guy um, 
this guy said that um, uh, even though we had not made much at Greenwich at all about me being Australian, I wasn't the spokesperson that we used for, you know, for the acquisition because we thought people might assume we were doing it just because of me, which certainly wasn't the case. Anyway, this radio presenter, he, he, he claimed that my passport should be confiscated. <laughs> and, um, and so I said to Carol next time we were going out there, I was half expecting when I got to the, um, you know, to the, um, um, border control post to see, you know, to see my photograph blue tacked up against the glass. <laughs> um, that didn't happen. And, um, and uh, so I, I believe I'm still generally welcome in the country, but of course we can't get there now, even if we wanted to. <laughs> Jackie Robinson. Jackie? Have you unmuted? Jackie Robinson. No, okay, well. Um, Hello, sorry. Oh. The, the, the struggles of trying to do things on an iPhone. Um, yeah, it was just another plug really for the, the links between Greenwich and Australia mm. and a reminder that of course Arthur Phillips, who led the first fleet mm. to Australia was an old boy of the Royal Hospital School. So I just yeah. thought I'd yeah. pop that one into the, uh, yeah. the, the rich, uh, Yep. mix of connections really and something in that link too which isn't greenwich but it's close by um philip brought back with him two um aboriginal australians um uh, uh went along with one and the other name escapes me the the um the the, the chap who wasn't ben along sadly died when he was in england and he would you believe is buried in the churchyard at elton uh, tended by all accounts by King George's physician in Eltham. Yeah, correct. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And that, that's amazing. And that, that's very little known. Um, yeah. Thank you. It was a really interesting talk. Thank you. Ian, Ian Boreham, you wanted another question. Yeah. Yes, you mentioned St. Alphage. Yeah. In Greenwich. There is a Cook Voyage connection. Yeah. Uh, in that William Crispin who was born in uh, Woolwich in 1751, became a carpenter in HMS Adventure, which yep. sailed as the consort on Cook's second voyage. Yep. Huh. He ended up living in Deptford and is buried at St. Alphage. He was buried there on the 17th of October, 1828. Hmm. And has his headstone survived? or Not that we're aware of, no. no. Okay. Oh, his wife you. also is buried there. Right. Uh, I have no idea how aware Cook was of um, of the wolf links, you know, with Greenwich. Um, none, none at all. You um, you um, I was wondering about that statue of Captain Cook that the Duke of Edinburgh unveiled. Yep. That was was at the uh -huh. museum. Got moved yep. about a bit. Yep. And then disappeared. Mm -hmm. Any? Do you know of any chances that it could get re-erected? Well, that statue, um, for others that, don't, that may not know, that statue was, um, uh, was created by a... Um, uh, Anthony Stones. Anthony Stones. And it was one of seven, I think, that was, that was made for, or at least original, was made to go in the New Zealand Pavilion at, at the um, Seville Expo in 1992. And um, one of the museum's then trustees, a lovely man called Sir Arthur Weller, paid for this um, um, a copy to be made that was um, unveiled at the museum in, I think, um, 1997 or thereabouts. And as you say, it moved around various parts of the site. And w when I joined Greenwich, it was, um, it was at the foot of the Jubilee Path, um, you know, um, that heads up to, to the observatory. And we removed it um, in 2008 because uh, that site was part of the site works, what was going to become the site um, of the Sammy Offer Wing. Um, and when the Sammy Offer Wing was built, um, we all agreed that it just didn't, its, its scale and whatever just didn't sit right with Sammy Offer Wing. So, so it didn't go back on display. Now, when I left the museum in mid 20, in, in 2018, mm -hmm. 2019 rather, the, um, uh, we were just beginning to undertake the first ever um, 
grounds master plan for the museum. And so the, the fate of the statue and where and what was going to happen with it was certainly part of those initial discussions. My assumption is that um, those discussions have been somewhat um, you know, um, held back because of the, uh, the, you know, the last 12 months in coronavirus. Um, so um, I, I'm not aware of what the museum may now have in store for it as, you know, as I'm no longer part of that planning process, master planning process. Thanks very much. I think it's a wonderful um, uh, a statue amongst yeah. all those that have been produced. Yeah. And yeah. given that it's a, more, a modern one compared to all of the many others that we've got out there, I think it's magnificent and we do certainly hope it manages to get up somewhere. Yeah, well, and I'm, I, as I say, I just don't know where that master planning work's got to. But are there any more questions? I've Could I ask one of Kevin? Can you hear me? Yes. Anne. Is that Raglin? Kevin? Hi, Anne. I don't, I don't think you can hear. Can you hear me? Yes. I mean, I've got a copy of the print you mentioned of the Greenwich pensioners, right? Yep. To Velga. And I've never noticed the meat cut in before. <laughs> what, was, what was the story of that? Because I didn't hear it. I've just gone and looked and you can see him cutting the meat, but what was the story? Well, the story is only that um, given that obviously when it was painted, when, when the painting was, was, was produced, the, the fate of, and, and Cal was best known because he was, you know, he had been with Cook and by that stage, he was the only survivor. Yeah left of the group who was ashore with Cook when Cook, you know, when, when Cook was killed. And so it just seemed to me somewhat um, um, uh, slightly odd that the artist has chosen to, um, to have Frank Cow um, carving the meat. That was all. <laughs> brilliant, brilliant. There's one story I've never told to people. <laughs> <laughs> Kevin, I think we've exhausted the supply of questions, um, probably exhausted you too. So thank you very much. Before I thank you, I'd just like to remind people briefly that we have two more um, talks lined up. We've got Danny Thorpe, leader of Greenwich Council, speaking to us on the 11th of March at seven o'clock, seven o'clock. Um, and we have Professor Jane Harrington, who is the new Vice Chancellor of Greenwich University, speaking to us on the 15th of April, also at seven o'clock. So do make a note of those dates, but we'll be reminding you repeatedly as the dates approach. That just leaves me to thank Kevin very much for a really fascinating talk, beautifully put together, beautifully illustrated, um, and, um, you know, a real, a real delight. Thank you very much indeed. It's a pleasure. Thank, thank you everyone for giving up their evening. <laughs> Good. Thank you. Thank you.